All right, why don't we go ahead and get started? I want to welcome everyone to Writing and Revising Narrative History with historian Megan Kate Nelson. My name is Taryn Edwards, and I am one of the librarians here at the Mechanics Institute of San Francisco. And this event was produced in partnership with the Institute for Historical Study, which we will talk about in just a moment. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Mechanics Institute, we are an independent membership organization that houses a wonderful library. You can see it right behind me. The oldest designed to serve the uh, general public in California. We're also a cultural event center and host activities just like this uh, many times a week. And we are also a world renowned chess club that is the oldest in the nation. Uh, we are in the process of recapturing many of our live activities at the Institute. So we still do quite a bit of virtual things. Um, I encourage you to consider becoming a member with us. It's only $120 a year. And with that, you help support our contribution to the literary and cultural world of the San Francisco Bay Area. I should say we were founded in 1854. So um, we've been doing it a long time. <laughs> Before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to introduce Anne Harlow, who is president of the Institute for Historical Study. Thanks for joining us, Anne, and for coordinating this. Do you want to say a few words about the Institute? Let's see, you are muted, Anne. Let me see. No, I, I'm I, there we are. Here I am. <laughs> Thank you, Taryn, for co-sponsoring this and, and hosting it on Zoom. And uh, yes, we're the other institute, the uh, Institute for Historical Study started about 45 years ago. And um, Many of our members either uh, have written history or are currently writing history. So when I happened across Megan's uh, stuff online, I thought she'd be an ideal speaker for us. Um, I also want to encourage you to become a member of the Institute if you're uh, writing history and um, or researching history even for other purposes than publication. Um, it's only $40 a year <laughs> and uh, you can find us online at tihs.org. So thanks for coming today and I'll turn it back over to you, Taryn. Okay, and we, we'll put those relevant uh, websites in the chat space in just a moment. Um, okay, so now I would like to introduce our speaker, Megan Kate Nelson. She is a historian and writer uh, with by way of Harvard and the University of Iowa. Uh, she specializes in the Civil War and the U.S. West and general American culture. She's the author of four books and a wealth of articles for well-known periodicals such as New York Times and Smithsonian Magazine. She now writes full-time, but prior to 2014, she taught U.S. History and American Studies at Texas Tech University, Cal State Fullerton, Harvard, and Brown. Thank you, Megan, for joining us this afternoon and for sharing your knowledge with us. Thank you so much. And thanks so much uh, for having me. Thanks to Anne first for extending the invitation. Thanks to everyone for coming um, and to Taryn for hosting us um, as part of the Mechanics Institute uh, and this uh, great series from the Institute for Historical Study. Um, First, I think I will, in addition to sharing my screen, um, I will just give you a, a, a very brief uh, history of, of my own kind of career trajectory. I know all of us here uh, have our own different stories, and that's the most important thing to remember uh, about uh, this whole gig, uh, whether you're in academia, whether uh, you transitioned out of academia, you've always been writing beyond academia, um, everyone has their own story and their own situation. Um, but it might be helpful to know mine so you kind of know where I'm coming from in terms of uh, writing and, and research and the, and the practice of history. So uh, I went to graduate school in American Studies at the University of Iowa after teaching for two years at a private high school uh, in the English department. So before I was a historian, I was a, an English teacher, although really I'm an interdisciplinary scholar. Um, I had been 
been a history and literature major undergrad and and then American studies, of course, is a profoundly interdisciplinary field. Um, so I graduated <clears throat> in August of uh, 2002, which I, I can't even believe that that's like 20 years ago now, which just totally blows me away that it was that long ago. Um, my first job out was actually an adjunct gig back at Harvard in my own undergraduate department, history and literature. Um, they like to call them fellows uh, or tutors, but really adjunct uh, contingent faculty. Uh, and then was on the, the job market the whole time, uh, ended up, uh, as Tara noted, at first Texas Tech uh, and then Cal State Fullerton. The reason for that move, um, as I think you know, all of you will um, probably have similar experiences uh, is for family reasons. Um, my husband is a lawyer. Uh, he was somewhat mobile, um, but our goal was always to end up in the, the same city together. Um, so moved to, to Cal State Fullerton, and then uh, we decided we needed to come back to Boston. And this was going to necessitate my leaping off of the tenure track uh, into really the unknown. Um, and I could do that because I had, uh, you know, a safety net of a, a partner who was making a salary. So there's that to consider. Um, but what that moment did for me, which is really interesting, um, you know, because one of the big themes, I think, in my career is there are sort of unexpected moments of opportunity. And so when we decided we needed to move back, I was working um, on my second book, uh, Ruin Nation. So here's here's the kind of trajectory, the story uh, in books. Uh, Trembling Earth was my dissertation, uh, turned into a first book. Um, you know, we can talk about that process if you'd like in the Q&A. Really, uh, it was not too terrible a one for me. I dropped one chapter from that project um, and it was pretty lightly edited before it came to press. Um, but I <coughs> was working on Ruin Nation. I'd been thinking about it had done a little bit of research um, on this, this project I wanted to do on destruction in the Civil War, um, but it was really the move back to the East Coast that really prompted me to apply for a bunch of short-term fellowships um, all over the East Coast to go to all kinds of archives that stored important Civil War records. And so I did that. I ended up winning five or six short-term fellowships, which was fantastic. Uh, got to do all the travel and the research for Ruin Nation there. So that was, that was an interesting opportunity. Uh, and I did manage to publish Ruin Nation while I was back adjuncting. I was able to go back to Harvard um, and adjunct for another couple of years. And published Ruin Nation, was very happy with it. Both of those two books were with the University of Georgia Press. Uh, and, uh, you know, loved what they did in terms of marketing the book and design and everything. And um, then... Uh, was on the job market and sort of belatedly realized that publishing two books and going on the market as an adjunct uh, really made me unhirable. Uh, no one would hire me as an assistant professor because I had 12 years of teaching experience and two books, and no one would hire me on the tenure track because I was an adjunct. So it was one of those horrible uh, situations that I realized really uh, later than I should have. Um, I was probably in a little bit of denial, um, but really then had a choice to make in 2014, whether to go back to an adjunct position for another year or to just make the choice to leave and to wor start working on this new project uh, about the Civil War in the Desert Southwest. And I had been thinking about <clears throat> this project for a little while. I thought it might be a trade book, but I really didn't know what that meant because I'd only ever dealt with academic publishing. Um, I knew enough to know that I needed an agent uh, before uh, I could sell a book to a trade press. I also knew that I didn't want to just write the book for nothing, to spend five years writing it and then either not be able to sell it or, or just go with another university press and make no money doing it. I wanted to you know, live the life of a, a working writer, even if they weren't going to pay me, you know, tremendous amounts of money. At least I wanted to, to have some sort of financial support from a publisher to do that. Um, and so I, you know, sort of made a deal um, with Dan, my husband, we thought, give two years to this. Uh, I went off in 2014, did a huge research trip around the Southwest, 
came back, wrote a proposal, sent it out to agents. And um, I'm, I don't have a, a slide in the deck on that particular process, but if you have questions about it and you want to talk about it, I'm happy to share uh, my experience with that because it's a very, uh, it's a different world. I think I had assumed that there would be a lot of overlap between the academic world and the trade publishing world, um, and there's almost no overlap. Uh, so um, I had no idea really what I was doing in the beginning. Um, and, you know, to, much to the horror of my agent who was like, what are you, what, what are you talking about? You have all these articles out there. That's not what you should be doing. Um, but we can talk about that, that process too, if you would like, but I was lucky uh, to, you know, pitch this project to an agent who understood my vision. Uh, I was making the transition into narrative history writing and, taking a cue from the fiction books I was reading that use multi-perspective narrative. So even for narrative history books, this was a kind of weird structure where I you know, was putting the reader down on the ground with nine different people and interweaving their stories together in chronological order. Um, I had never done this before. I didn't know, I thought I could do it, but I also, didn't have any experience doing it. Um, was lucky enough that an editor at Scribner, Kathy Belden, uh, edits a lot of experimental fiction. So she was willing to take a chance on uh, this historian who had this sort of zany idea about how to structure a history book. And um, I began, you know, writing this book and published it, uh, turned it in in 2019, published it in February of 2020, just a couple of weeks before the pandemic uh, began. And, and Taryn and I were talking before about, you know, the Zoom and events like this and the changes that the pandemic has brought into our lives um, that really kind of stalled the promotion process for the Three Cornered War. Um, in those first couple months, you know, if we remember back at all the events got canceled and it took a little while for everyone to get back to Zoom, but Zoom has been great because it, had, it allowed me then to kind of pick back up and share this book with a much broader audience than I think I would have had if everything had just uh, stayed kind of in real life and in-person events. Um, so, that book was published in, in February 2020 by um, really the previous May, I had pitched Saving Yellowstone, which tells the story of the 1871 scientific expedition to Yellowstone and the Yellowstone Act, which resulted from that expedition, which created the first national park in the world. And I knew I wanted to publish that book on the 150th anniversary of the creation of Yellowstone National Park which was March 1st, 2022. So that was my first experience writing a full book, uh, researching a book on a deadline. Uh, and I did that pretty much during the pandemic, about 80% of the research and writing of Saving Yellowstone. I did kind of from where you see me now um, and in my living room. Um, so that's also something that we can talk about uh, during the Q&A if you would like about uh, how everyone's doing uh, with pandemic conditions and, and doing research and writing and the challenges there and if anyone has any you know good tips for getting that done. So uh, Saving Yellowstone is not quite as intensive in terms of multi-perspective as uh, the Three Cornered War, but it continues the narrative history uh, writing that I have really come to love. Um, and so I thought that would be the first thing I would talk about today, uh, would be kind of how to shift if, if you all out there have, you know, master's degrees, PhDs, you're kind of used to writing in a more academic mode, how do you then kind of switch uh, into a narrative history mode? What does that entail? Uh, what does a trade history book even look like? How do you uh, conceptualize a project like that as opposed to a project uh, that is more academic in style? Um, so, you know, so what I tend to think of <clears throat> as a kind of academic narrative style is an argument driven book that is often thematically structured, although many of them can be both chrono chronologically and thematically structured, um, where you gather a ton of evidence um, from all different kinds of sources. Um, you know, like here are 57 examples, like for my purposes in ruination, here are 57 examples of the ways that soldiers destroyed trees, right? And then shaping that into a chapter about the destruction of trees during the Civil War. Um, picking your best examples to prove your argument. Uh, most of the time, it's an introduction, five or six chapters, a conclusion. Uh, all of those chapters begin with a descriptive, really richly detailed opening, 
turn to historiography and then a kind of well-organized uh, structured chapter that is argument driven. So that's that's really the kind of template in academia for books. Uh, and that's the exact template that I wrote um, Trembling Earth and Ruination in. So when I was turning to Three Cornered War, I really had to kind of create some new muscle memory, right? Because you you learn to write in that mode and you keep writing in that mode. So so what are some of the, the ways to really <clears throat> do this? How do you think about uh, narrative history writing or trade history books a little differently than, than academic projects? Um, the first and most important thing, and, and you know, often there's a lot of talk, especially on Twitter and in other um, forums about, you know, kind of writing for the public or writing trade history and that you need to write accessibly in the language that you use, you know, no jargon, you know, use, you know, very clear images, um, not any like super complex sentences. And I actually don't think that's as, as important. And I actually don't think that's as much of a big deal. Like I think a lot of academic writers actually write beautifully and write really compelling books. Um, but it's the structure that makes them really radically different from narrative history and trade history books. So um, if you're thinking about your project and you're thinking, is this a trade history book? Most books like this uh, tell a story with a beginning, a middle and an end. Um, most do have a kind of chronological propulsion, although not all of them. Um, I've read some books, you know, that came out with Scribner, my publisher, uh, that are not, in fact, structured that way. So it's possible to do that a little differently. But most narrative history writing is chronological. It has that kind of um, energy, the kind of beginning, <clears throat> the beginning and the middle and the end. You're telling an overarching story. Um, I, in the, in the beginning, I loved a good flashback. Uh, and I, <laughs> I wrote you know, much shorter chapters, uh, and this is something I should have included here, uh, you tend to have much shorter chapters in, in narrative history writing than in, in academia. So thinking more, you know, 15 to 20 pages instead of 40 to 50 pages. Um, and I just, I loved a good flashback. I'd start each chapter at the beginning at a later moment and then, you know, be like, 10 years before, blah, blah, blah. And my my editor was just like, you need to stop doing that. <laughs> like you need to, you need to kind of, put the reader in the flow of time and keep the reader there, except it, at separate moments, maybe a couple of moments where you do a flashback, but not all the time and not always at the beginning of a chapter. So um, try to, to get a handle on the flashbacks would be one of my, my uh, pieces of advice there. And, you know, just because you are telling <clears throat> a historical story does not mean that your story does not have arguments. It's just that the argument is not driving the structure of the book. And you're not usually signposting as much, right? So you're not saying, you know, in this chapter, I will argue that, or, you know, it is ironic that da 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 da, or as the historian so and so has argued da 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 da. You're really your your goal in narrative history writing is to immerse readers in the historical moment, as they might be immersed in a novel, in that that sort of scene setting and that sort of. Uh, transportation into the past. And then you <clears throat> have to really um, interweave the arguments in a subtler way. Uh, and this can make it a little harder actually for students to read the book and really understand what it is about because the signposting is sometimes very useful. Um, so, you know, all my two most recent books and the one coming up um, that I'm writing now do have prologues that are a little more explicit about what the point of the book is. Uh, at first I thought I didn't need to write a prologue, um, but <laughs> again, my editor said, no, you can't just drop us in uh, to this moment with no warning and no understanding of what's happening like a novel, right? This is a history book. People need to understand the context. So there are usually prologues or a preface, something to kind of give the reader a sense of what is coming, who is coming, and what the major arguments are. And then you can interweave those a little more subtly kind of throughout the book. So structure is one thing that's very different. The use of evidence is also very different. Um, you're compiling, I find myself still doing this, I'm still getting those 57 examples, but I'm using them in a different way um, to create action, not to prove an argument, uh, but to create a scene. So. Um, and that's what I mean in terms of plot, sort of who's doing what and when, uh, and then also what people said and when they said it. 
And I'm going to give you an example of this. Uh, hopefully you can read it with the, if you need to minimize, uh, you know, my face, you can definitely do that. So um, this is uh, just one example of how I was using a primary source, how I might have used it in an academic book and how I actually used it in narrative history format. Um, so the the top here, and usually I wouldn't overload a, a slide with text like this, but this was the only way I could think of um, to actually demonstrate what, what I mean here about using evidence differently. So um, this is the journal of Captain George Tyler, who is in the Second Cavalry, uh, posted at Fort Ellis in Bozeman, Montana, uh, who was the uh, officer in charge of the escort of the Yellowstone expedition under Ferdinand Hayden in the summer of 1871. So he kept a journal, which is great. It's logged in at the Yellowstone National Park archives. Uh, and I was able, I wasn't able to look at it myself because of COVID conditions, but I was able to hire a graduate student who lives in Montana, uh, who was able to access the archive and take photos of it for me. So, um, so he writes this great, this is a moment uh, when the entire expedition has come upon Mammoth Hot Springs, uh, which they called the White Mountain, uh, which was the first time that any uh, scientists, any government officials had seen that particular feature of Yellowstone National Park. Um, so here's George Shiler saying that he, you know, he wished he had his journal uh, so that he could actually write down his first impressions in the moment, but he had left it with the pack train. Uh, and then he gives this assessment, you know, that he thinks it's going to be the greatest curiosity in the country, probably the world. And then that Professor Hayden had turned to him and 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 said these things to him, that he had traveled all over the world, he'd been exploring all this time, and he had seen a lot of wonderful things, but all of them sank in insignificance compared uh, with this. So if Saving Yellowstone had been an academic book, I would have taken that piece from George Tyler and kind of mined it to prove a point about the Hayden Expedition's responses to Mammoth Hot Springs, right? Um, you know, they looked upon the White Mountain with awe, this wonder is destined to be the greatest curiosity in the country, George Tyler wrote later in his diary, right? Because we know he didn't have it with him in the moment. Um, you know, Hayden believed, you know, uh, that the all of those he had previously seen sink into insignificance. So that's how I would have used that quote in a traditionally academic book. Down here at the bottom is how I actually used it. So this is from um, the, the first past edited, copy edited uh, PDF of the book. Um, it's changed slightly uh, in its published form, um, but th this is pretty much how it made it into the draft of the manuscript and how it was published. So after gazing upon this marvel, the leader of the Second Cavalry Escort, Captain George Taylor, uh, reached into his pocket, groping for his diary so he could record his first impressions. He had left it with the pack train, however, so all he could do was stare. After a moment, Hayden turned to Taylor. I've traveled all over the world, he told the soldier. I've been exploring 17 years. I thought I had viewed all the great wonders, Hayden paused, but all sink into insignificance compared with this. So this is how I was using, and obviously you see there's a there's a, um, a problem with the spelling that gets, this is the first pass. So there's some copy editing that needs to be done here uh, with spelling and with some other things, but um, I'm using this quote instead to sort of set up a scene where these two men are sitting there looking at, at the White Mountain at Mammoth Hot Springs, and they are reacting to it, but I'm dem demonstrating that moment to you with this evidence as part of narrative history, instead of proving an argument with it. Um, so, and we can talk about different kinds of strategies, but this is one of uh, the ways that you use evidence to create action, uh, either with plot or with dialogue. So here I had actually, you know, this very nice piece of evidence that Hayden had actually said something to someone else. Uh, and so I turned that into dialogue as if you, you know, it were a novel and you could see people speaking to each other and hear their words um, kind of spoken out loud as action uh, instead of just words on the page as evidence of something else. So another way that narrative history writing is kind of different um, from academic writing and, and you really, and this is the part that I really, really, really have loved. Um, that because I'm an environmental historian, um, I love thinking about places, thinking about landscapes, thinking about my place in them. I notice a lot of detail about them. 
Uh, and this is one of the best ways to really embed readers in a historical moment, uh, is to give them a sense of place. And one of the ways you do that is through all manner of details, um, physical details, uh, color, uh, any kind of sensory detail that you can possibly have. What are the sights that people are seeing? What are their smells? Um, you know, what would these people have encountered in the past? You always have to be careful, right? And think, well, what was actually here uh, in this moment um, versus what has come later? Or am I using a source from a different date? And it's leading me to think that this building was in this place and actually it was not uh, at this moment in time. Um, so you need to be pretty rigorous about your research in these details. But what they really do is create a vivid sense of the past uh, for your reader. And this is the stuff I really, really love. Uh, I use photographs, period photographs, and also modern photographs to do this. Um, I use all kinds of maps, including uh, USGS uh, ecoregion maps, which are amazing. They, they have done them for every single state uh, in the United States. And you can go in and look at a, at a town level and it will tell you uh, what kind of ecosystem is in that region, what kind of soil it has, what trees tend to grow, what kinds of you know, shrubs and grasses uh, typify that region. Uh, and you can kind of then investigate its, its status at that moment and see if there in fact would have been uh, these kinds of, of bushes and what color were their, um, their flowers. And if people are, if you know from other sources that people are coming by and, and stopping and picking things up, uh, you can have them interacting with a landscape that is uh, really rich in detail. And, and what I've given you here on the, the right-hand side of the slide is uh, an overhead photo of Three Forks, Montana. And this is from my current research project, which is called The Westerners. Um, one of the protagonists in that book is uh, Sacagawea, uh, who most people know as Sacagawea. Um, and she was taken from her people at Three Forks at this particular landscape uh, in 1800 and forcibly removed to the Missouri River, uh, where she was married off to a French trader, and four years later met Lewis and Clark um, as part of the Corps of Discovery. Uh, so this is where she was uh, with her Shoshone band uh, when she was kidnapped um, and taken uh, into enslavement. And so I wanted to, to start that scene with her, and so I needed to know what Three Forks looked like. I had driven by it, but I've never been there, So um, and I will go there uh, before the book is published. But I wanted to, to gather as much visual information to see what this place uh, looked like, compared it to the Lewis and Clark journals and got a sense that it was fairly similar. The All of the, the riverine tracks are very different um, because as we all know, water moves through places uh, in different ways uh, and changes the landscape around it. Um, but all of these uh, rock formations were, were there in situ at this time. And so I was able to use this and some ecoregion details uh, to really place her in this uh, particular landscape at that moment uh, to set up that scene of the kidnapping. Um, so the, this is the kind, I mean, and I, I have I did not anticipate I was going to love this part of narrative history writing as much as I do, but I have I have gone down rabbit holes for days at a time trying to figure out uh, using, you know, city maps, you know, what color brick a building may have, <laughs> you know, been uh, at the, at a particular moment in time. And, you know, it's not an important argumentative detail, but it is, it is something that really enables you um, to convey a vivid sense of the past. And this is necessary in narrative history writing. Uh, and the other thing that's necessary is biography. Um, people want to read about people. Uh, and this was always my, my biggest complaint about academic history writing. And even when I was writing it myself, you know, you had all these great quotes from people, but they seemed, you know, you'd identify the person who wrote the diary or wrote the letter but they were always just kind of hanging out there as just a name, right? And for me, a military rank. And you never got a sense of them as a real life person, you know, living in 3D in the past um, with a life, with complicated feelings. Um, and unfortunately, I think that's academic writing structure kind of leads you into that. You are, uh, you know, people express ideas as if they're just a kind of brain uh, and a and a you know a hand to to write out uh, the letter rather than a full living breathing person who is writing that letter in a particular context. Um, so 
all of you know the the past two books and the one that I'm writing now are all very rooted in in biography in the lives of, of individuals who are taking action at a certain moment. Um, and these are the kinds of stories that people, I think, uh, general readers really want. Um, they want to be rooting for someone. They want to be compelled to turn the page to find out what happens to these people. Uh, one of the first questions my editor asked me before she bid on the book on Three Cornered War was, who is the heart of this story? And at the time, I didn't really have an answer for her. And I thought that I had blown it. Uh, ultimately, I kind of figured out that the heart of the story was Juanita, uh, who is a Navajo woman uh, who gets embroiled in the Civil War in the Southwest, Southwest in a really unique uh, way and at a pivotal moment uh, for the Diné, the Navajo people. Um, so I now have an answer to that question, but I always think about that now, right? Because the, the question we usually ask about academics books is what is its argument? And what is its intervention, uh, rather than who is the heart of the story? But in narrative history writing, it's always going to be the who. Um, the big ideas matter, and the big developments matter. But it's people who are doing these things, you know. Um, and so we want to know about them. Uh, we want to know about the people who were important in the lives of their families and their communities, uh, you know, who made change in the world. Um, and, you know, even the people who didn't, the people who just went and, and lived their lives uh, and maybe didn't do anything particularly remarkable, uh, but still their lives tell us something really interesting about the past. So, you know, you write, you write the narrative history and you write the book. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about Revising, because revising is is actually my favorite uh, part of the process. I know it's painful for a lot of people, um, you know, that you you write all of these words and then you have to cut or rearrange them. But I actually find it a, a really interesting and fun challenge uh, to revise. And I also am more, much more relaxed about it because I'm like, well, I already I have the words there. Now I just get to play around with them or maybe, you know, cut some and add some others uh, and do all kinds of things. Um, so my usual process is that I revise actively while I am writing. Um, whenever I'm ready to write a chapter, uh, I sit down, I write the, the first um, section. I don't actually write by word count. I know a lot of people do, and they find that challenging and, and very useful. Um, I don't as much. I find it a little anxiety producing to say, you know, I have to write these many, this number of words today. So instead, I write by chapter section. So I know when I go into writing the chapter that I want uh, to have a, a certain pacing that I want, you know, four sections, and this is what they, they're going to do. And so I write by section. And if I finish that section, then I usually kind of leave a, a, the first sentence of the next section for myself for the next day. So I have a place to start. Um, but that next day I come back and I actually start reading the chapter and I revise and I edit and I usually change some things. Sometimes I think, oh, that section's not really working um, or I need more information here. I add details. I maybe put in a, a few more footnotes. Um, so that by the end of, of maybe a four or five section chapter um, or four, four or five scene chapter, I have revised that chapter five times. Um, that last section hasn't been revised very much. Um, it usually gets dumped into the draft and then gets gets revised later. Um, but I find that really helpful, not only to really immerse myself back into the chapter, but kind of reread what I've written, edit as I go, and kind of see how the chapter is taking shape uh, from the beginning. Um, once I have written all the chapters, usually in a part, um, I will go ahead and look at it and, and read it as a whole and see if it's working as a structure. Sometimes an overhaul is necessary. Sometimes one chapter will have to go and you'll only be able to take a little bit of it and put it somewhere else. Um, that's happened in both of my projects. Um, Three Cornered War, the submitted manuscript was 160,000 words. And the published book was about 100,000 words. So I cut 60, that like almost a third of the project, um, well, more than a third of the project, um, when, uh, you know, ultimately. Uh, and 
you know, I don't regret any of those cuts. Uh, a lot of it was just sort of detail that I loved and wanted to write about that wasn't really essential to the the telling of the story. Um, but I got to use other pieces of it. You know, you never should delete that entirely. Just put it in a file, um, uh, the equivalent of your, your desk drawer, and bring it out again um, for either promotion time or if you have an idea for a spinoff, op-ed or feature, something like that. Um, and I also, in Three-Cornered War, that book has three parts. The first part, I overhauled and restructured probably four or five times uh, before we hit on the, the, the current structure and its published form. Um, and that, necessi that necessitated, because it was chronological, it necessitated rewriting the beginning of all the chapters that had been reorganized. Um, one thing to be mindful of with all of this revising is to, to be very careful about your footnotes and your endnotes. I learned that lesson the hard way. I cut a big section, didn't really think about it, went back and had some missing footnotes. Um, and you know, luckily the copy editor caught it and, and we got things going, but I was just like, oh no, <laughs> this is a huge problem. Um, so, so be mindful of that and also, uh, do all of your cuts, create another document for editing so that you have the original document that you can refer to later uh, when things like that may happen, when footnotes or endnotes get lost. Um, then there is, so there's the kind of after writing restructuring, which is the big overhaul, but then there's also just kind of cutting when you go through and if you have to lose words, sometimes you don't have to lose words and that's great. But uh, if you really need to edit down, I go into all of those editing sessions thinking, these are not my darlings. I'm not killing my darlings. They are words. Uh, and if they are not doing any service, <laughs> then we're going to get rid of them, right? Um, so I, I have very little remorse while editing. And I will cut, sometimes I'll cut entire sections. Sometimes, sometimes I'll just cut uh, words or phrases in order to get the word count down. Um, and that's a really good discipline to kind of go through and say, do I really need you know this particular adverb here? Do I really need this adjective? Can I restructure this sentence to be more streamlined and lose a couple words in the process? Um, and I really enjoy the, the challenge of that too. I know it's very perverse and strange. Um, most people do not enjoy this part of it at all, but but I I really do because you are you're taking what you've already created and you're reshaping it, um, which is uh, a really kind of interesting challenge. And finally, and I think this is the the last thing I'll talk about before we open it up into a, a more general discussion, um, is that you know Anne and I had discussed uh, kind of my talking a little bit about pitching op-eds and features, um, because this is something you may not have as much experience with uh, as writing longer longer format um, kind of books. Um, so, you know, a, a lot of times I get the question, you know, why would you ever do this? Why would you write op-eds? Why would you write features? Um, there are a couple of reasons why. Uh, if you have an anniversary uh, coming up of the event that you're writing about, um, uh, or if you have something like Father's Day or Mother's Day, you're writing about parenthood, things like that. Um, those are what uh, newspaper or magazine editors call having a pin or a peg. And they um, they like to have those sorts of pieces because they they create readership because people are already interested. Oh, this is, you know, July 4th is coming up. Oh, here's this piece on the history of the 4th of July. Um, often uh, you can write an op-ed and, or even a feature in response to current events, uh, different things that that happen, like the January 6th insurrection or the flooding in Yellowstone. Um, when that event happened, Smithsonian Magazine reached out to me and asked if I'd like to write uh, basically like a 1500 word piece about the flooding and some aspect of it. And so we kind of discussed how I might write that, what I might write about, um, hit on a topic for that. And um, I just pounded out over the next couple of days and they had reached out to me on Tuesday and they published the piece on Thursday. So uh, that was a kind of crazy uh, experience. And I'll talk about that uh, here in a second about the speed of this kind of writing. Um, if you have a book to promote, your publisher uh, would uh, like you to do a lot of the promotion. And this is one of the ways that you do it is that you pitch uh, some related op-eds um, or features to newspapers or magazines. Um, and you'll see in the sample pitch here on the right that this is what I was doing uh, to promote Saving Yellowstone. Um, was pitching the New York Times a piece about the debates about the Yellowstone Act. So this was more of a political uh, part drawn from just one chapter uh, of the book. 
And so when you're thinking about things that you're maybe cutting from the project overall, these can be really great uh, subjects for op-eds that you can use as promotional material uh, for your books publication. And you always want to do that a little in advance, kind of pitch them about a month out and see if they're interested. That gives you some time, that gives them some time uh, to consider your pitch um, and for you to pitch it to a number of different places. Another reason is if you just wanna experiment with writing in this form. Uh, this is a very different kind of genre. Op-eds are usually about, depending on the, the outlet from anywhere from 800 words to 1500 words. And those are, that's, those are, two very different kinds of, of structures for these pieces. Uh, and depending on what the outlet is too, some, some place like Made by History for the Washington Post uh, really likes the, the historical sort of pin. So if there is something going on right now as a current event and you have something you know really useful to say about the historical context that created this moment, uh, they will love that pitch, right? So. They really love that kind of thing. New York Times isn't as much interested in, in the current event pin. Uh, they'll kind of think about and, and look at other sorts of things. Uh, same with Smithsonian Magazine. Um, so, you know, the, these are different kinds of formats. And if you, you know, just are interested in writing in different kinds of ways, then op-eds and features might be for you. Um, so how do you go about even pitching one? Um, you can use the site submission form. Sometimes these are extremely hard to find. And so my advice is always uh, to go instead through a personal contact. Um, if you know someone who has written uh, for the outlet you want to write for, um, and you know I've written uh, for the New York Times and the Atlantic and the Washington Post and Smithsonian Magazine and um, Time Magazine, and I have those contacts if, and I'm going to have my, I'm going to post my contact information here at the end. So if you would like that contact information, just reach out to me and, and I can get it to you. And that's, that's always much more useful because it goes directly to them, right into their inbox and you're not dealing with some weird submission process. Um, so what do you include uh, in your pitch email? Um, you may have written the piece already. You may have not written the piece. You may just have an idea for the piece. I've done, I've pitched in both of those scenarios. Um, this piece that I pitched to the New York Times, I actually had not written it yet, um, but I had all the material from the book. So I figured if they took it, uh, I would you know, be able to write it fairly quickly, um, but I didn't include it in the email. Um, but what you want to include, pitches are very short. They're usually only like this, three very short paragraphs. First paragraph out of the gate is just, I'm writing to pitch a piece uh, for you. Um, that argues this, um, or that does this kind of work. Um, and then the second paragraph kind of gives a little more specificity to that, uh, kind of elaborates just a tiny bit on it. Then a paragraph on your biography, and then basically you're out, sort of either the piece is included below or um, you know, the piece is not included, but I'm happy to send it to you. Um, I'm happy to make edits. I'm happy to do, you know, do whatever. Um, and so that's it. That is all you want to send. Uh, don't uh, use an attachment. If you have the piece, don't use the attachment because they won't open the attachment. They're, they're going to want to read as it was described to me. And I'm not sure how much this is true now in pandemic times, um, but as it was described to me, the editor will be standing in line waiting for a coffee and they want to be able to scroll through your piece. They're not going to click on a, a attachment and read it in a PDF format. So um, include any hyperlinks that you think uh, would go with the piece, any footnotes if you would. The, the New York Times has a very, very intensive fact-checking um, department. And so I included end notes on this piece so that they could fact check and I would have them um, because I knew that already about them. Um, so you wanna just include all of those different elements. You wanna give them a chance about 48 hours uh, to consider your pitch. If they don't get back to you within that time, usually that's a no. Um, although sometimes I'll kind of circle back if I really, really want um, their attention and then figure it may have just slipped by them. Um, the hardest thing to do in this scenario is to just press send. Um, and you just have to kind of close your eyes and do it. Um, and the more you do it, the more comfortable you will get with it. Um, cause you know, 
there, there will be rejections. I have been rejected many more times uh, than I have actually published pieces uh, in op-eds and including this one, this one got rejected uh, by the New York Times. So you will always want to pitch just one outlet at a time. It may uh, feel more efficient to pitch four of them, but uh, you never wanna do that because what if all four of them say yes? Then what are you gonna do? I mean, it's a very good problem to have, but one of the things that you're doing here, not only is getting a really good publication and getting good writing experience and editing experience in this format, but you're creating a relationship with an editor. And so you don't want to pitch them a piece, have them take it to their, their kind of board of editors and, and, you know, kind of rally for it and then say, oh yeah, no, sorry, I'm taking it somewhere else. Right. Uh, so this, this moves fast enough that uh, you will have, most of the time, you will have time uh, to actually pitch it to at least two or three other places. And if, if three places say no, it really depends on the piece. Sometimes I've kept on pitching and sometimes I've just been like, mm, okay, no one's interested in reading this. I'm just going to, I'm gonna again, put it in a desk drawer, maybe at some other point um, I will come back to it, but no one wants to read this right now. Um, so one of the things to get comfortable with is rejection. Um, it will happen fast. Uh, usually it is very polite. Uh, sometimes they just ghost you and that's just the way it is. Um, the other, another thing to get comfortable with is writing quickly. Um, so you either have to write again, write the piece beforehand. And I guess I did do it with this one. I wrote it beforehand, but others I have uh, actually pitched and then written the piece while I'm waiting for them to respond. Other times I don't write it at all until they respond. Um, other times, if especially if it's breaking news, you're going to need to write really fast. And the fastest that I have ever done anything like this was a piece for Washington Post um, the day after the January 6th insurrection. Um, I pitched the piece to them at nine in the morning. And by noon, it was ready to post. I pitched it in a slightly longer form than here because I was working out some ideas and I, and I know them pretty well, but, um, that was, that was definitely the fastest. And, uh, they didn't actually end up posting it until the next day at 5.00 AM because of everything they had lined up, uh, but they did have it ready to go. And so you have to be able to respond when the editor says, yes, I want to see it. And then you have to be able to respond when the editor gets back to you with the editing and there will be editing. There are oftentimes quite heavy editing. Uh, and so you have to really think about, you know, well, what are you willing, what hills are you willing to die on for this piece? And they're different for every piece. Uh, you will have no control over the headline. Um, if the, he if the headline they give it is wrong, uh, then you can say, this headline is wrong or misleading, but uh, for the most part, they will give it the headline they want to give it. Uh, and uh, you have no real control over that at all. Um, but the editing will be heavy. Often there will be fact checking. Uh, and so you need to be prepared. I had to give once photocopies of my own book as evidence. Um, you know, like there are some things that, that you know, as historians, we all know, and um, and many journalists do not know. And so they'll be like, well, you know, could you please provide evidence that the Battle of Antietam took place in September 1862? And you're just like, okay. <laughs> so you just provide, you take a picture with your phone of, of a textbook that has that date in it, and then that's good enough for them. But um, whatever they ask for, you need to be ready uh, to give it to them whenever they decide to run the piece. The, the fact-checking process will happen within about 48 hours of publication. Um, and the, the editing too. So uh, it does demand that you are fairly flexible and that you would have the time um, to dedicate to that kind of process. And sometimes you do and sometimes you don't. And, some, and this form of writing uh, may not uh, be for you. It's not for everyone. Um, there's no you know, requirement that we go out there and, and write in this format. Um, but I have found it really fun, not only from a writing perspective, but also in just being able to, to write for a larger public where there are, you know, tens of thousands of readers reading uh, this piece you wrote, uh, this short piece about this historical moment. And, you know, and sometimes readers, you know, will write extensive comments uh, in response <laughs> or write you personal emails about it. Um, but uh, for the most part, my engagements uh, with this format have been really, really positive. So really, 
my my final um, comments here are just that you know finding your voice uh, in new genres, whether you're kind of moving from a more academic book format to a a trade history format, or whether you're experimenting with op-eds or features, you're kind of writing in new kinds of ways. Um, it takes time. It takes some time and it takes some practice. Uh, you're not going to kind of get into the groove of this new style of writing necessarily right away. If you do, hooray, awesome. Um, but for the most part, it, it takes a while uh, to get used to it and to, again, kind of create that new muscle memory for yourself. Um, but uh, also, it's just really fun. It's really fun uh, to be able to kind of turn your, your mind and your writing talent uh, to this different kind of challenge. Uh, so I encourage you all to do it. Uh, and I have this contact information up for you. This is my personal Gmail. Um, feel free to reach out uh, at any time if, if we don't get to your questions during this session. Um, and then you can always reach me also through my website, uh, MeganKateNelson.com. That also has links to a lot of the op-eds that I have written and, and other kinds of writing that I've done, including blog posts, um, that give advice on agenting, finding an agent, selling a book proposal, um, yeah, all that, all that good stuff. But I will stop there so that we have some time uh, for questions uh, and any comments uh, that you guys have. All right, great. Well, thank you so much. That was uh, so much material that I'm glad that we <laughs> recorded the event so we can go back and uh, catch up. <laughs> um, <laughs> the first question I have is from Jim Gasparini. He asks, when your agent told you that writing articles was not what you should be doing, what, what was she or he suggesting that you do instead? Okay, um, so so the context for this was um, my agent Heather Schroeder uh, at Compass Talent is represents very few historians. Um, mostly, she represents journalists. She represents um, fiction writers and cookbook authors. Uh, so, <laughs> I was her first academic historian, and when I pitched Three Cornered War to her, and when we sold it to Scribner. Um, you know, I think we had just discussed the project and it hadn't really occurred to me because the academic tradition is to publish articles out of your project. And I had already published one, two in, an edit, in edited collections. I had one um, kind of in production for an edited collection. And then I had a journal article um, that was in production. And all of them were about the Civil War in the Southwest. None of them had had the kind of style of Three Cornered War. Um, but they all had some content. So, so when I got the contract for Three Cornered War, uh, the contract ex explicitly states that you cannot have any material from the book out there in the world uh, until a couple of months before for promotional purposes. Hmm. So I was like, oh, uh oh. And so I called my agent and I said, here's the deal. Uh, you know, before I knew this was going to be a trade book, this is what I did, um, because this is what we do in academia. And she, I could hear, I'd never met her before, actually, in real life at this point. And I could hear her brain like explode on the other <laughs> end of the phone. Like she was just like, what? She's like, what do you mean you have articles out there? I was like, look, in academia, this is the way you do it. You share your research. Like, and she's like, well, she's like, at least did you get the copyright? And I was like, we don't do that either. And she was like, and so, and especially when she heard about JSTOR, <laughs> I thought she was going to lose her mind. Like she was like, okay, you, you don't hold the copyright on your intellectual property. And the people who do own the copyright have just sold it to an aggregator that can infinitely replicate it for money that you don't get. <laughs> I was like, well, when you put it that way, <laughs> sounds really bad um but it's the sharing of knowledge and she was like they're gonna steal your ideas and I was like that's ridiculous like nobody why would anyone but she comes from a different world and this is what I mean about like the trade world and the academic world does not they just do not overlap um so really when you are working on a book project when I was working on saving Yellowstone I published nothing um, and I didn't even present on it at conferences. Um, I would talk about it in general, but I didn't publish anything until the promotion process when I published four um, op-eds 
and features um, to promote the book. And so that's the way that the trade uh, industry, publishing industry prefers to do it. Um, so just be mindful that if you are thinking that you, you know, you have a trade book project and you have pieces out there, uh, either go out and, and I actually successfully negotiated for those remaining two pieces I negotiated for the copyright, um, because at least then I had that, uh, in hand, but so negotiate for the copyright for all those pieces, if you have them out there, um, and you're able to do that. Um, and then, um, you know, otherwise just kind of make your editor, possible editor and agent aware that those pieces are out there floating around. Um, so yeah, it's just not the way it is done in trade publishing. Yeah, which is one of those hard lessons. <laughs> yeah. Um, great. Well, I think we're all frantically taking notes. <laughs> um, James Clement has a, a, a question that kind of uh, dovetails with that last one. In finding an agent, what would you say was your top mistake and what advice would you have for a first timer? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Because this is always an interesting question because I didn't know how to do any of this. The biggest mistake I made is that I queried five agents at one time. Um, that some, some agents, including my own current agent now only told me later, she had no idea I was talking to other agents. And she was like, why are you talking to other agents? And I was like, uh, well, because I thought that's what you were supposed to do. Um, and some of them will say explicitly on their websites, if they're fine with you, like doing multiple queries and some agents are, it just so happened that Heather was not, she didn't, yeah, was not on board with that. Um, which, you know, I, I didn't figure out until, you know, it was too late. So I would say, um, what my, the usual process that I recommend to people is if you're looking for an agent, go and, and look at the acknowledgements in the books that you really admire, um, history books in your field, um, people you might know, and see who their agents are. If they have an agent, who their agents are. And then contact those people and just ask them how they like their agent. Did, you know, did the agent do a good job representing them? Would they recommend them? And then if they could have, if, if you could mention them, in your query to the agent. So basically when you write a query to an agent, what you're doing, and I have some longer blog posts on this and on my website. Um, and uh, that basically you um, write to them, you say, this is who I am. So-and-so recommended that I speak to you about my book project, which does this. And then that's the big, that's the one sentence pitch. Sort of tells the story of this, um, you know, as part of the, a larger, you know, uh, really important moment in the making of America or what, whatever, whatever your big sell is, right? Um, then talk a little bit about the book itself, how it's structured, um, the kinds of sources you're using, what's new and interesting about it. And then again, one sentence bio. And then if you would like to see a book proposal, I'd be happy to send one to you. And then end email. Um, so before you send that email, you know, do your research, figure out who, who are the agents who are representing the people who you, the writers you really admire. And then uh, usually they will have their contact information there. They'll tell you if they're accepting new clients or not. They'll tell you what kinds of things they tend to, to uh, represent. Um, and then go one at a time. Make a, make, that was the big mistake I made. Uh, but go one at a time in order of who your preference would be. So if you have like, I really want, you know, like David Blight's agent, like that agent seems great, um, you know, and seems to also be representing a bunch of other historians uh, in the field who are doing work that I admire. So I feel like this agent will get it, right? And will have the the right contacts uh, to to really talk to editors at the presses that I would dream of for myself. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, go one by one. And, and again, you know, agents will, they will either not get back to you at all. And they'll usually say on their website, if you don't hear from us in two weeks, you're never going to hear from us. Right. Um, so that's a no. Um, but usually they will get back to you within a matter of days. And so again, this moves very fast. So if you know your number one agent is like, no, I'm sorry, I'm not taking any new projects or no, this project doesn't seem right for me, then you can move on to the next one. Uh, so that would be my 
my big piece of advice, <laughs> aside from like how to find an agent who might be a good fit for you, um, go do not uh, query simultaneously. Um, <laughs> But, but yeah, the, the, and the agents will give you a really good sense if they think that your book, you know, you might think that your book is a trade book and it might be, or it might not, you know, they have a, they have a very good read uh, on the market and what they're, what they're seeing and what they think that they can sell. And, you know, I talked to an agent who said, I like this idea, but I, I don't really understand what you're doing with multi-perspective and I don't think I could sell it. And I was like, well, then you're not the agent for me. <laughs> And that's fine, you know, and, and thank you for chatting and have a nice day. <laughs> so that was the, that was the extent of the conversation on that one. So, you know, you're not going to have a good fit with all of them. Um, and, but they, you know, they have a very specific job, which is to get you, uh, a, you know, the kind of editorial relationship that you want and um, money in advance. And so they are in your corner. You are perfectly aligned with them, which is great. Mm -hmm. All right, we are bumping up on time, but I did want to ask one question uh, related to craft. Um, Lewis asks, or I should say he quotes, reached into his pocket, groping for his diary. Mm -hmm. does, does that quote uh, resonate with you? And then he asks, is this documented or some sort of interpolation or speculation? Yeah, that was more speculation. Uh, that was more my kind of reading uh, the diary and he's saying, I wish I had the diary with me, but then I, you know, like kind of realized I left it in the, in the pack train. So how, how did he realize that? And I figured he probably went for it and was like, oh, <laughs> I left it. So I'm just going to sit here and stare right at this, at this piece. And, um, you know, that kind of, uh, imaginative leap is something that happens more often in narrative history. Um, you know, and all of it is, is grounded and all of it is, um, sourced from either a diary or a letter or a, a battlefield report or, or something like that. Um, you know, I would never just sort of make up a color or, you know, make up a destiny, say someone died when I don't know that they died, you know, um, you always want to be careful about, about things like that. But I think there are ways that we can um, kind of look at a source and think about that moment and, uh, really imagine the action that's taking place. And then also, um, any kind of emotional resonance, right? I mean, the, their words have emotional resonance. Uh, and so you can make a pretty good guess as a historian, especially if you're reading the whole source and you get a sense for the person also. Um, and you kind of pull these things together uh, into the creation of that scene. Right. And of course, wh however, whatever you say is going to be relevant to the scene that you've already created. So, right. Um, okay, so then let me see what else that we have that is not just a lot of thank yous in the um, in the chat space. Anne asks, what about blog posts that might have content that you might use later in a book? How do you how do you get around that? Well, if it's your if it's your own blog post, like if it's on your own website, then that's totally fine because you own the copyright to that. That's all yours. Um, sometimes, you know, the, the, it depends on how much content there is. Uh, if it's just a blog post of 800 to a thousand words, like that's not, that's not a lot, but if it's a whole, if you've published like basically an article length type of thing with a lot of, you know, analysis or, or things that you're going to actually take whole cloth and put it into the book, uh, you're going to want to maybe, flag that for your editor, um, or just kind of, you know, figure that their, their main concern is selling books, right? So their main concern with having that content out there is that if you're already giving away the content for free, why would any reader buy it? Right? So, um, they don't want too much content out there to dissuade readers from buying the book. If you have some content out there, some of it won't be a big deal. Some of those, you know, my editor didn't care about the academic pieces because she didn't see that the book was gonna, she wasn't concerned about academic readers, really. She, you know, she was, she was like, well, the academic readers will come to your book because you have an established reputation in academic 
history. Um, what we're trying to get are the general readers, right? Who don't know who you are, but they really love the topic and they want to read the book. So you can't just have, you know, all of your research out there and all of your arguments or else why would, if they can get it on your website, then why would they do that? Uh, if you've written something for someone else, if you've written um, for a magazine or a newspaper or a blog post for another website, um, often that website will have copyright on that for about a year. So you'll want to, that that's, sometimes you sign contracts for those, sometimes you don't, but it's sort of embedded uh, in the business that they will keep it for a year. So um, just think about that uh, before you maybe write for, for someone else and give them a lot of your content. Um, especially, you know, if you are, if you're writing a book where you have, uh, you know, you found like a trove of documents that no one's ever seen before. If you, you know, that kind of stuff, I'd, I'd keep, you know, pretty much under wraps um, because that's the kind of stuff that editors love. You know, they want, they're like, oh, this is never before seen documentation of this particular moment. Like this is, this is something that we can use uh, to sell the book. And it, and it, and it makes for a great story too, um, that you can tell when you're doing promotion for the book, you know, on radio or podcasts or things like that. Um, and, and then also, you know, informs the argument of your book. Um, so I would say, you know, a, a lot of that is more judgment call on your part, but just be aware that, trade book contracts explicitly do say like no direct, like no actual content from the book itself out there in advance of the book publication. Okay, here's another question about craft. Uh, Rob says he is working on a narrative history that involves multiple perspectives. And right. he's asking for some advice on how to communicate the different perspectives. The, the, one, um, the one book I wanted to recommend to him, and sorry for my librarian head coming into being, but the book about Henrietta Locks. She, oh, yes. she yeah. uses a, a braided, she, she calls it a, bra a braided technique, but that's one book that I know of that uses, that, that uh, outlines several perspectives into one narrative story. Yes. Um, but take it away, Megan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I completely agree. The the Henry Lacks book is great. Uh, they're a book like um, The Warmth of Other Suns um, by Isabel Wilkerson, which tracks three different people through different great, great migrations, you know, and those those people never met. Uh, and they weren't really in the same place or same time in many cases, although that their time frames overlapped. Um, those are very interesting. There are lots of different ways to do it. And sometimes um, what I was doing for uh, Three Cornered War, I really was taking a lot of inspiration from fiction and multi-perspective narrative in fiction. Um, so my my chapters were very much, I'm putting you here on the ground with John Baylor, this Confederate Texan, and you're going to be with him through this certain length of time as he kind of marches toward El Paso and, um, and you know, forces a, a federal fort to surrender and then creates the Confederate territory of Arizona. You're gonna be with him for the next 18 pages when he does that. Um, and then, and, and the chapter is entitled Baylor, right? And then the next chapter is, is someone else. And then you go. And I, I thought about kind of changing my narrative voice slightly uh, as a fiction writer might. But then I was like, uh, I don't know, that might come off as a little gimmicky. Um, so I ended up not doing that and just letting uh, most of the the um, protagonists in that book had left just immense records in their own voices. And so I was able to use their words again in the in the kind of way I was showing in the slide deck, um, using their their words as dialogue. Um, and they, many of them were very vivid speakers. And so you're really getting a kind of sense of them in their individual chapters. Uh, and then there are chapters in Three Cornered War. There are three of them. They're all battle chapters where multiple protagonists come together. And so what I would usually do is have them in each, within those chapters, you would have, you would know you were coming from a from you know Alonzo Ickes's perspective as a as a U.S. soldier, and then you were 
getting Kit Carson's perspective, leading another regiment in that same army. And then you were getting, you know, Bill Davidson, the Confederate, uh, who was across the battlefield, like facing them. And it, you, you knew that was happening just because I was usually doing a section break and then giving you um, their voices from their own accounts of, of how that battle went down. Um, so there are, there are different ways to interweave um, and most of the time I just, um, do it through section breaks or chapter breaks. Um, and because I haven't had a situation yet where the, the two protagonists are actually talking directly to one another. Although I did, I think I had like one or two moments in three cornered war like that, but they were rare, but they were exciting. Cause I was like, Oh, look, here are these two people who, who, you know, have these very different lives and suddenly they're together and they're actually having a conversation. That's amazing. Um, and so you kind of set the scene for the two of them to be together in that moment. Um, but for the most part, you're either putting them in the same place, um, or you are, uh, kind of giving them the same context if they are living in the same historical moment with kind of larger developments, how one, how two different people may have reacted maybe to like, in, in my context, the news of Gettysburg, right? Um, one celebrated it, one did not. Um, and so you you get a sense then that, oh, these are two people whose lives maybe didn't intersect, but they are, they're living in the same moment and responding to the same kinds of things. Um, that there are there are lots of of um, and increasingly more kind of books like that that take. I mean, the Devil in the White City does that a little bit because you get the intensive kind of point of view from the the serial killer, and then you get the views from the architects, and then a more general kind of historical view overall of what's going on in the moment. Um, and did you have any other books that you think of when you think of that kind of bringing? multiple people into play not offhand I don't I don't spend enough time reading history books I think <laughs> I, I was gonna say that that uh that was an excellent uh recommendation devil in the white city I did read that one but it was yeah. several years ago everyone read that one <laughs> yes and that seems to be his style I mean I, I like it and he does it really well um, I have to excuse myself, but Anne is going to continue to pepper you with questions. Um, and I just wanted to reassure everyone that the I will send Anne the link to the video. And uh, that should happen next week. So thank, thank you, Megan. Nice great. to meet you. And I will duck out and you all can continue. Okay, great. Thanks. Thank you, Taryn. Thank you, Megan. Um, yeah, and other people who want to put questions in the chat, please do. Um, I have sort of a mundane one. Are chapter titles, other than the date range, essential? And if so, why? Mm. And it seems like a pain in the ass to try to make up a, a, a good title for each chapter. For each chapter, yeah. Um, the I think, again, it depends on the book. I mean, my um, I think chapter titles are more certainly more traditional in history books, right? They aren't as much in fiction. You'll get a mix in fiction. Sometimes they'll just be numbered. Sometimes you'll have a descriptor. Um, sometimes you'll just have a phrase um, or a date or something like that. Um, Three Cornered War was interesting for me because those chapters are just the names of the people you're going to be following. So, you know, chapter one was Baylor, but then chapter nine was, or eight or to remember, um, <laughs> was also Baylor, right? Because you came back to him later and each protagonist had um, at least two, sometimes four chapters. And so when you look at that table of contents, it looks like, what is this? It's just all people's names. And then, except for the ones where it's a battle. Um, and so those are, you know, Valverde and, and Gloria de Pass um, and Sei, which was Canyon de Shea in the Diné homeland. Um, so you can choose to do it whatever you want. I think a table of contents actually signals to the reader some interesting things. It, it signals your approach. Um, Saving Yellowstone, I had um, phrases as titles um, just to give the reader a sense of, of where things were going. Probably about a third of those chapters were, ju were just single people chapters, and then the rest of them were more combined chapters where the there were three main protagonists in that book. And sometimes they were together kind of in a larger chapter about a, a particular moment. Sometimes there was just a focus on one of them. Sometimes there was a chapter on the passage of the Yellowstone Act that didn't really have, it had 
uh, all, all three protagonists in there, but not as main figures. The US Congress was the sort of main figure there. Um, and so, you know, the title of that chapter was uh, in relation to the, the text of the Yellowstone Act itself. So I, I think it's really up to you. Um, I will say that in a trade book proposal, you usually provide a chapter outline uh, and that that is usually about a paragraph or two of description for each chapter. You don't have to provide a title at that time, uh, but your editor may have thoughts about what to do with titling or, you know, is is just a kind of big space and a page turn enough to give your reader a sense that, oh, we're in a different space now. We, we have started another chapter. And, and then the book I'm working on now, uh, the chapters are just numbers. So it's just, and it'll have uh, multiple parts and then it'll just be one, two, three, four, five, six. So it'll be interesting to see if your editor says, oh, but you have to have titles <laughs> for each chapter. Yes. And she will have opinions. And and I, you know, I usually, sometimes there will be things that I fight for, but for the most part, I take my editor's feedback because she's, she's great. And she also has the best interest of the book at heart. Uh, and um you know, really wants it to be the best book that it can be. So if that means that the chapters need titles, then. <laughs> then so this is, you've, you've sort of settled in with this one publisher for a third book, is that right? And yes. the same editor. Yes. You know, and that, cool. that often happens. And actually, I don't know if anyone out there has been uh, watching, like I've been watching uh, the, um, it, it's actually being live tweeted on, on Twitter. I'm not sure you can get it any other way, but it's the antitrust trial uh, where oh. Random House is attempting to buy Simon & Schuster, which is my publisher. So, the, and the government is saying no, because those two publishing houses are two of the, of the big five. And so to the government, that means less competition about everything. So the, the trial has been fascinating uh, and, and many times entertaining, including when Stephen King, who is a Simon & Schuster author, was called to the stand and they said, you know, can you please tell us your name and what, and you know, what you do? And he said, I'm Stephen King. I'm a freelance writer. <laughs> Which I was like, he's one of us. <laughs> <That's selling laughs> Hooray. <on. laughs> Hooray for Stephen King. Um, but yeah, so uh, what usually happens is that um, you'll sell a book and I mean, well, it depends if you have a really good experience with that editor and, and most people do, most people develop a, a really nice relationship with their editors. And so, and I did with mine. And so I submitted the manuscript um, and my, my agent feels very strongly that you pitch the next book before, like basically between your submission of the manuscript and, and when it goes into production. Um, so the, you know, the editor is feeling good about things, you know, they know that they're going to publish the book. It's going to be great. Um, so I did that for both the other ones. I, I submitted, um, in February three cornered war, uh, pitched and sold saving Yellowstone in May and they get the right of first refusal. Like they want to see it first and they could, they could have always said no. Um, they could have said, you know, no, we're not interested in this book. Uh, you can either take it elsewhere or whatever. Um, and then, but they took Saving Yellowstone. And then once I had um, submitted that and it went into, and I think they accepted it uh, into the production cycle in June. And I sold the the next book I'm working on, The Westerners, um, in September. So, um, and, you know, you you develop a rapport. And I think the press also kind of has a feeling about it that, you know, you are an author that they would like to continue working with. Um, you know, they would like you to be, you know, and for, for those of us who write history, we're sort of known as mid-list authors. We're kind of not, probably not ever going to be on the bestseller list, even though we'd all love to be. Um, but we have solid sales that last a long time. And, you know, the books get good reviews and you provide a lot of kind of shine for the press. Um, and so that um, I never it would have like freaked me out a little bit to, to go uh, try and sell like the most recent book to another press. Um, and I, I wouldn't have done it unless um, my editor was either said, no, I don't want that. Or, you know, I'm leaving the business <laughs> and going somewhere else uh, that I would have been sort of forced to, I think. Um, but yeah. 
Okay, I have another question from Jim, who's uh, writing a very interesting book about the cultural history of fire. He says, oh. I've, been, I've been told that publishers on the level of Scribner's will not consider nonfiction books unless you can present them with a marketing platform likely to sell 10 to 20,000 books off the bat. Did you have such a platform when you approached Scribner's and of what uh, did your platform consist? You know, the platform thing is so weird, I have to say. Um, I mean, I had, so when I sold to Scribner, it was 2016. So I was already on Twitter. I had about 10,000 followers, but uh, as we all know about social media, about half of those are bots and not real people. And then the other 5,000 are, you know, who you actually engage with on Twitter is a very different sort of thing. Um, and I think I was on Instagram. At that point, I was on Facebook. I'm no longer on Facebook. Um, but that was really it. Um, <clears throat> when they took their first bet on me, it was solely because of the writing and the proposal. Um, and that's what my editor told me. So <clears throat> they never know. I mean, and I think this is what, this is what the, um, the, uh, trial is also telling us because they're they talk to a lot of editors they talk to a lot of um kind of heads of the of imprints um and then also the big wigs at the at the actual trade publishers and for the most part they don't actually know what's going to sell or not they have good ideas about things if someone's an established author then they know um if someone's like stephen king of course they're like uh oh, like the next book, of course, is going to sell like a million copies, you know, minimum, right? But also, but also the topic, just the general topic, um, they, they're they going to have some idea of how broad an appeal that's going to have. A lot of us are writing, you know, about pretty narrow stuff, you know, local Bay Area history or whatever, um, whereas Jim's cultural history of fire um, yeah. Every, every, people keep making jokes about how that's going to catch fire and stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's going to burn the house down. Yeah, um, yeah, and that's great, and that's great, and um, yeah. I mean, I think that a platform they would like you to have a platform. Uh, they would like you, so you not. Think Twitter to... is worthwhile, I guess. <clears throat> I think. That. Do, yeah, I mean, I think they do think Twitter is is worthwhile for promotion purposes, but I think they also know that it can work the other way, that most often if the book does well, then people will come to you on Twitter, right? It's, a, it's that weird thing. And when they will come to you, they will follow you on social media because they read your book. Mm -hmm. They will not follow you on Twitter and then buy the book. Um, and you can't really, you can never count on your Twitter base to actually sell books for you. And that there was actually a New York Times article about this a while back where they were talking about um, I think, I don't even know what publisher, maybe even Simon and Schuster, um, gave Billie Eilish, the singer, like a $6 million advance for her memoir, her memoir. She's like 20, right? Like, um, and, uh, and they were thinking because she has millions of followers on social media, right? And she's a rock star, right? She sells millions of copies of songs and her book sold 60,000 copies. <laughs> Right. So, and in publishing terms, that's, that's not good. That's like for that much of an advance that those sales, which would be amazing for us, right? Like are not good. Um, and it's because who's her social media platform, her social media platform, like who, who's actually following her, like teenage girls, mm -hmm. did teenage girls read memoirs? Apparently not. Right. So, so they read books so, probably. Yeah. Not. <laughs> it's, 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 yeah. And so it is, it is not necessarily a matter of how big your platform is and how much reach it has, but the quality of it. So are you, do you have like a, the vast majority of my Twitter followers who are actual real people um, are writers and journalists and historians, right? So they are people who will buy history books, right? They will teach them. Uh, they will talk about them. They will, they will do things. So, so that is all part of that consideration. But never have I heard that someone's book was rejected because the author did not have a platform. Um, the editors are primarily concerned uh, with whether they think the book idea is a good idea and that it's original. Um, and they want to see in the book proposal, not only the writing sample, but in the entire proposal, 
um, how good your writing is. And that's what they're really assessing, um, at least as far as I can tell. The, the feedback that I've gotten from my own editor is, is that. Um, but yeah, I have never heard of anyone, you know, not getting a book contract because they were like, well, you really should be on Twitter. Right. <laughs> so, okay. so that's um, a good how, news. We're, you're not we're, a, we're almost out of time, but um, did you, did you have an editor um, edit your books before they went to uh, publishers? No, I didn't. Um, you mean in terms of oh, a developmental itself? editor or um, like or a developmental a... editor? Yeah. Uh, no, um, I. So basically for readers, what I do, um, I don't really show anything to anyone unless my um, like my editor and my agent want to see pages. And so I usually send them I usually send them like part one. Um, my agent wants to read the whole thing. She's, and some agents are more involved and in, like that and some are not. Um, but my editor wanted to see pages. She wanted to see part one of Three Cornered because she didn't, you know, she had not worked with me before. So she wanted to actually read pages. And she gave me some really good editing feedback on that. And I revised, that was part of the first overhaul um, was in response to her comments. And, um, and you know, they don't give, developmental editing kinds of comments though. They don't give like really, they don't give line editing comments mm -hmm. uh, until much later. So, um, but what I do do is when I finish a draft and I go through it myself and do a revision and I am about ready to submit, um, I actually hire two readers uh, in, well, for three cornered, I only did one cause I didn't have enough time, um, but a reader in my field, um, to read the book and give me comments. So for Three Cornered, I, I hired a Civil War historian uh, to read it and turn it around really fast. That's partly why I was I was paying them uh, a fair amount to turn it around in about a month. Um, and then for Saving Yellowstone, I had a reader in Reconstruction history and a reader in Lakota history um, because Sitting Bull, uh, Tatanka Iotake is one of the protagonists in that book. And I wanted to make sure that I was getting that Lakota history right. And so I hired those two as readers. They were not, again, not really giving me line editing. They did give me some overall comments, um, you know, about the flow of the book and how it was fitting together. Uh, but mainly I, I was using them as, as a kind of peer review uh, because trade publishers do not have peer review. Um, you're just dealing with the editor. Um, but, you know, my editor is really great, especially with the, the big structure um, issues and sort of saying, you know, I love this chapter, but it's not really fitting uh, in here. Can we, like there used to be in Saving Yellowstone an entire chapter devoted to the painting of the painting you see on the cover, Thomas Moran's Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone. Um, and it was from Moran's perspective. And she was just like, I love this, but it's too long. We haven't really gotten to know Moran before this. So like, what can you do with this that's not a whole chapter? <laughs> and so, and so I actually turned it around and made it from Hayden's perspective because I had enough documentation that he had come to see Moran during the painting and all of this. Um, and it and it went from a chapter to about six pages uh, in that. So, so she gives those really great kind of structural comments, and that's in the editorial phase at the end. Um, but I've not hired um, a like kind of trained developmental editor. It's more of a, a peer review process, but I do have them look at it. And I also have um, several writing groups. I love, I will always argue for and campaign for uh, writing groups. I love them. Uh, and I will show them individual chapters along the way. And they often give me really good comments. I'm getting like encroached upon by the sun. This is how yeah. I know at the end of the summer. My, my Zoom like, events let me see yeah here we go uh, my zoom my zoom events um earlier in the summer never had any sun problems <laughs> so the sun's getting lower in the sky right. I'm coming to get me. there we are well mentioning writing groups is a great segue into something i guess i neglected to mention which is that the institute for historical study has a writing group that mm. meets once a month and then we've all gotten used to meeting on zoom for the past couple of years um, so, uh, that has, um, been a good draw for new people to dis dis discover us, um, 
because it's all history related writing as opposed to some writing groups that are a lot broader. When I first joined, there was they were specifically biography writers, but uh, it's expanded from that. Um, let's see. There. So, yeah, I'm looking over at the chat too. Is there, I mean, I, I always say I could go on with this forever, um, but it's, <laughs> it's 3.30 and we probably <laughs> should stop, let you go, go get some dinner, I guess, because it's like, is it 6.30 your time? That's okay. We're, we're late eaters in this household. Well, that's fine. <laughs> um, okay. Here's somebody who says, do publishers prefer that the book not be completed yet? Oh. Why would they? Oh, um, so, so I that think they could yeah, I mean, I think that depends. I, I think there are a lot of editors who like to shape the book uh, or help shape the book uh, and the idea of it. Um, it's a different, I think, I mean, I haven't experienced this because all of the books I've sold, um, I have only on proposal and I've only written like one chapter basically. Um, and this last one, I didn't even do a writing sample. They, the advantage of working with the same press is that they know you're writing already. So you don't have to do a writing sample. You do have to do the rest of the proposal um, and make a good case for it. But uh, you don't have to do that because they know uh, that you can write and you can complete the book. Um, wait, I lost track of the question. What was the question? Uh, do publishers prefer that it not be completed yet? Oh, they, so they oh, yeah, have right. input. Um, yeah, I mean, I think they take it either way. I think agents, I think they sell books maybe a little differently in their completed form um, rather than a proposal form uh, that is all kind of a, per a perspective, right? Like you're like, well, it'll probably turn out like this. And I know that, um, you know, all of our books change from the proposal stage to the final product. Um, so it must be interesting for editors to kind of see that happen. Like, in the proposal, you said you were going to do this, or like my proposal for three cornered, I was going to have 35 chapters. I ended up with 23, you know, they don't hold you to the, the book proposal <laughs> necessarily. Um, but they do kind of expect that it's still going to remain the same general book, right. And the same kind of, uh, as you imagined it in the beginning, if that changes, they're going to want to talk to you about it. Um, especially if it changes quite radically. Um, but, I think in terms of how the agent sells it, that just means um, the editor has an opportunity to read the entire thing rather than just a proposal. Um, so I think maybe they approach, they might approach the offered slightly differently, but I don't know if there is a preference actually. I'm but not for sure. First, first time author, I would think probably the more you have done, the better. So they really can. Yeah. So they can get a really good sense and they know, right. and especially if you're, I mean, this is why I feel so lucky that my editor took a chance on me because, you know, I'd written the first two books, but they were very academic and in tone and in writing style. And yeah, so what well. I was proposing to do was very different. And so I think she was like, well, that doesn't, I'm not sure I can really think of that as a writing sample because mm. like you're a good writer and a strong writer in those books, but what you're going to try and do is totally different. So I'm going to need to see some proof that you can actually do that but but yeah and I would agree like if you have a lot uh definitely send it because then that will give them a greater sense of you as a writer and then the book project itself unless they I mean don't they often say all we want to see is one sample chapter don't send us your well, whole manuscript or I mean if if they say that if there is that directive then follow whatever their directive is if they don't want to see the whole thing right. don't send the whole thing um and, the, and your agent will help you with that particular process. And if the agent, the yeah, no, they're can... fine with getting the whole manuscript because then they get a sense of you as oh, a writer. Too, but see, any, yeah, you, you gave us some tips on finding an agent. Um, okay. Well, we had a, uh, some comments about um, 60,000 would be good for a small press or whatever. Yeah. There are many small presses that don't require an agent and have lower sales expectations. Yes. Um, yes, absolutely. And there, there are some, um, what I kind of refer to as the, <clears throat> as the kind of mid trades, like the academic trades, like basic, you know, Knopf, Norton, some, some, um, presses, I mean, Norton does a, a broader sweep than that, but a lot of presses that specialize in, uh, kind of Scott, the scholarly book field, they publish more history than other things. Um, those presses, yeah, you can go to without an agent and, and they prefer it because the agent will try and, Get them to pay more money, right? Um, and because <laughs> uh, they want to make money, yeah. right? Again, so, you so are a lot of, yeah, you're our, our, 
the people in our organization probably are mostly just hoping to find a publisher uh, right. so they don't have to self-publish um, and not worry yeah. too much about the money. But um, but it's 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 exciting to hear from someone who is, I guess, making significant money doing history well, writing. And it's nice to get paid for your work, right? Well, like right. The, like yeah. so much of so much of academic publishing, you either have to pay for or or you just get paid nothing right and or you yeah. may get back later on on royalties but it is nice i mean and even if they give you you know what would be considered a small advance of five thousand or ten thousand dollars like that would pay for your for some research trips right that would pay for you to go and and do some things um for the book and so that's always nice uh, to have that um and that kind of sense that you are getting paid for your writing i mean that's an important thing um as yeah, part of, I didn't, not I didn't the only realize, thing. not the only realize, thing. right. I didn't realize there was that big a difference between academic and trade presses. I know. No. Believe me, and I didn't either. And I <laughs> so I was like, <laughs> yeah, my poor yeah. agent. She was just she didn't know what to do with me for the first two years. Now I'm a little better about everything. I'm a little more savvy. But... Let's see. Are there any other new questions? Um there was, isn't your bio considered part of your platform? Your your credentials, expertise, previously oh, published yeah. books, are those part of your platform? They are, they are. And, and that is a way that you've established your reputation. You know, if right. you write pretty regularly for, uh, you know, a magazine column or newspaper, you have that kind of um, expertise and you have that kind of publishing record under your belt for general readers. I mean, I think for trade publishers, what they want to see is that you're engaging a kind of larger reading public um, beyond the classroom. Um, I mean, they think classroom sales are great. They love that. That's, you know, consistent sales over time. And so they're never going to, they're never going to be sad about that, but, uh, but they do want to, you know, it's always good when you have um, any kind of piece of public writing out there that gets, you know, tens of thousands of, of reads. I mean, that's great because then people are introduced to you. They may follow the link to your website. They may, you know, Kind of understand you as an author. So uh, yeah, I mean, and that's really good. And they also, again, like those, those kinds of pieces of writing are part of the promotion process. And so, um, you know, they like you to, to give it a try. Sometimes it doesn't work again. Like I couldn't get anything about saving Yellowstone into the New York times. Like it just was not happening. <laughs> I tried twice and on two different topics and they were like, no, no. So I was about <laughs> to say, we didn't, um, we haven't, really touched on author websites. Um, oh, yeah. Did you have trouble getting people to, and like, did you work at getting people to read your website and follow your blog? Yeah, I mean, I, I used a very basic kind of WordPress template and had the blog, which is called Historista, which I was pretty active with from 2014 till about maybe 2019. Um, and I use it to, to, for a lot, for a couple of different purposes. Um, if I have a piece that I wanted to really wanted to write and had written, but I couldn't post it anywhere. Sometimes I'll post that on the blog. Usually it's more, um, either advice pieces, or if, if I'm talking about something on Twitter and people are like, can you write this up somewhere so that I can have it? And I don't have to search for it on Twitter. Then I'll, I'll do a post about that. Um, sometimes I'll do a roundup. Like I did a roundup of all the January 6th insurrection pieces that historians had written. Um, so that's, that's a piece on there, which is more of a kind of bibliography. It's not my um, intellectual work product, but it's just a, a resource that people can have, which is good. Um, but the the website is really important uh, for you as an author because that's how people find you, right? Like if you if you pitch an agent and your agent is like, who is this person? And they Google you, you're going to want them to find your website and you want that website to look good. And you want that website to kind of give a sense of who you are as a writer and then also give examples. I think the most important pages of my website are the the speaking and writing um, pages that give you links to either. So there will be a link here soon um, with the link to this YouTube uh, so that people can watch it later. Um, and so it becomes a resource. And I actually did have, um, I was contacted by an editor for Preservation Magazine, and I can't remember what she had read of mine, uh, but she wanted me to write a piece um, for them. And so we talked about it and I ended up writing something on Adobe architecture in the Southwest for them. 
<laughs> a little bit random article, but, but it was great. They like, it was the first time I've ever been paid to travel somewhere and interview people. And that was super fun. I'd never done that before. Um, but she told me when I was talking to her, I said, well, how did you find me? And she said, well, I read this piece that you wrote. And whenever I read a piece, that's really interesting. I sort of clip it and put it in my author file. And then I kind of come back and, and she said, but the essential next step is that I can find you to contact you. And she's like, you would be shocked at how many writers do not have websites. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes, you know, many historians, especially if you're teaching, you'll have a website with your university. Um, But often if then you leave the university, that website goes away, right? So you never want to post content on that. Often you can't post content on that. It's not very usable. Um, So now I think, I know people who like Squarespace. There are lots of um, places where you can, kind of launch your website. And what I would recommend for that, if you haven't done one yet, is to, for the website to be in your own name, not the name of the book, um, because you'll want that to remain stable. You'll want people who are looking for you to be able to find information about all your books there um, and be able to find links to your other writing and, and be able to contact you through the website itself. And so that I highly recommend an author website. And, and these days, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a great computer person. I don't have good instincts with any of that stuff. Um, <clears throat> so I still have my WordPress. I, I have friends who have hired people to do kind of a little more sophisticated websites that, you know, have the like book in 3d, like turning in space and like things like that. And I, am I am not sophisticated enough to like figure, I barely figured out how to link to my like Instagram and my Twitter on my main page. And that took some doing. So I felt like a genius after I was able to do that. But, um, but I think just the basic stuff, just to have a page that's an about you page and then a page for your most recent book. Um, and then a page about, you know, here are the other things that I've written uh, with hyperlinks that people can use to, to find it. Cause they want, they want to find you and find out more about you. And that's what the website should be doing. Wonderful. Um, one more question from Jim Gasparini. Your first book was a cultural history. How does that genre fit into the difference between academic and trade publishing worlds? Oh, yeah. Well, that was, I mean, you know, <clears throat> Trembling Earth was my uh, was my dissertation. And so to sort of announce that book as a cultural history of the Okefenokee Swamp sort of staked my claim in environmental, like environmental and cultural history together, which is what I also have done. I mean, what, what, connects all the four books where the, I showed you all four covers. Uh, what connects all four of those is my interest in kind of weird places, right? <laughs> places that people have fought over, they are contested landscapes, people use them in different ways. They've entered the American imagination in different ways. And so to use cultural history in the title was just kind of signaling to the reader and to the academic community that I am a cultural historian, um, but that I'm also an environmental historian. I don't know that I would ever use that phrase in a trade history title. Um, usually they like, titles are so weird. Um, you know, Saving Yellowstone, actually you can find its original cover art and original title out there if you look for it. Um, it was originally called This Strange Country, uh, which we thought was a very nice poetic title, but really close to the last minute there was an objection to it in the publishing house and we had to change it. Hmm. That was a stressful time <laughs> for me um, oh. because we had to think of it, right? And you, and so uh, what you wanna do with the titling is not only have a title that is easy to pronounce for radio show hosts and podcast <laughs> people and everyone who's gonna be introducing you at an event like this. Um, and, and also one that gives readers a really good description of what the book you know, kind of contains, right? And so for the most part, trade histories will have, um, I was looking them up when I was trying to figure out what to call saving Yellowstone and and often they will have a verb in the title, like saving, they'll have like a gerund verb um, to, to create action in the title. Um, and then the secondary title, I think what I did is I looked up all the Pulitzer Prize winning books and I was like, what, what are their secondary titles? What do they tend to have? And the the most popular format was, X and Y in either the making of America or in 
the something something era, you know, kind of a time period sort of thing or a more general historical claim. So those are the kinds of subtitles. So that's why Saving Yellowstone is exploration and preservation and reconstruction America. <laughs> Cause it's, it's telling, and that doesn't encapsulate the whole book. Um, you know, the, the chapters on Sitting Bull are not encapsulated in that title necessarily, but it is signaling to the reader that this is a book about reconstruct. It's a book about Yellowstone. It's a book about exploration uh, and, and knowledge and saving the environment. Um, but it is positioned as a reconstruction era book. So, I mean, there are all sorts of like weird things about titles um, and why we make those choices. But at the at the trade houses, the title is almost always about marketing. And right. So authors don't have much control ultimately over there. You have book some title. control. I mean, they they consult you. Mm -hmm. And it is a back and forth. And in fact, both of these, both um three cornered and and saving yellowstone are my titles which is shocking to me because i'm terrible <laughs> i am terrible like the and and three cornered war originally was called the path of the dead man and oh. my a, my editor from the beginning hated that title so i knew it was going to have to change and so then we went on a hunt for a possible title and we went back and forth about it for a couple of weeks um with saving yellowstone we had less time it was like a matter of two days trying to find wow. that time. um yeah so they will always have ideas. You you have some input. Um, you have all, and you have some input on the cover art and and font style and stuff. But most of the time, you are presented with like, here are your options. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which one do you like best? Right? Um, because they know they're they're the experts. They're the design experts. They know what sells. They know what people tend to look at on a shelf, and what will pop out. Like not only on a bookshelf in a bookstore, but also as a thumbnail like on bookshop.org or on the author website, how is it going to really pop, you know, in these certain ways? And they, they know what they're doing. So I, I tend to trust uh, the design people on those matters. Although I do like what I like and I'll say, you know, oh, that font seems a little, you know, can we muddy it up or can we do something <laughs> else it or can it be it, can it be in another color, you know, and then they, they'll, they'll send things back to me and then We'll see how it goes. But my my editor usually expresses her preference right off the bat, which is a helpful guide. Because <laughs> I'm like, well, I know she likes this one best. <laughs> right. We'll see how I feel. But Okay, well, we really are going to uh, wrap up now. Um, uh, I wish you could see all of us applauding and oh. uh, read, all, read all the thank yous. But um, um, appreciate uh, uh, seeing you in, in virtual person. <laughs> yes yes and, exactly um, and everything yeah. you've had to say and it'll be written up in the institute newsletter oh, great. and um we'll yeah and you can go ahead you can go ahead and pass along in that and the, oh. the other uh roundups my um you know my website and my email address yeah um, and, yeah and everyone out there you should completely feel free to to reach out um if you have any questions more specific questions and just say that you were here so i know <laughs> what the context is right. um yeah, and, okay. and we can have a chat. I'm happy to help. Thanks so much, Megan. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you. Have a good night.